how is covid ma'am ah uh, it is i think it is now under control are have you people been vaccinated already yeah yeah we are we haven't been okay. till now okay okay it has started from 16th of this month okay all right going on going on mm. okay don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah last thought <laughs> yes so how is work in uh, in spain uh, now it's come back to normal okay a few months there was totally totally a drastic dip and the cases but now it's all back to normal right mm. so your interest is mostly in neuro oncology right yeah yes ma'am okay so dr vani has got a good assistant then yes <laughs> 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 okay yeah, <of> <laughs> should we start yeah yeah right. so Good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of Pursue and this is Pursue 7L Neuropathology and we are streaming live from Nimhans Bangalore via Kolkata and today we have two very important neuropathologists uh, here we have Dr Nandita Goshal who's an MD from Ames New Delhi and FRC Path a specialist pathologist pathologist at Sakara World Hospital Bangalore and a visiting visiting senior consultant at Sri Satya Sai Institute of higher medical sciences with vast experience in neuro oncology we have had the honor of having her to talk on the approach to gliomas and she will be moderating the session so i would request uh, dr goshal ma'am please take over and please introduce the speaker and so from there we will start uh good evening everyone uh, today we have a very promising and young neuropathologist with us uh dr shilpa rao from nimhans she is assistant professor of neuropathology in nimhans bangalore and uh, she's a gold medalist from jipmer she has done a dm dm in neuropathology from nimhans she has got numerous publications to her credit in indexed national and international journals she has got prestigious dbt welcome trust early career fellow today she will be presenting navigating the complexities of brain tumors case oriented presentation and expert experience so let us see what she has for us and i'll request dr shilpa rao to treat us with the fantastic cases which she has brought in her kitty thank you so much ma'am for that wonderful introduction so i'll start sharing my screen Yeah. Um uh, is my slide visible? The first slide? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Please Thank you. So, good evening everyone. Today's topic uh, that I have been given is navigating the complexities of brain tumors. Uh the topic uh, really seems complex, but then I'll try to make it simple. So, what I'm going to do here is I've taken four cases which uh, give you an insight towards the upcoming newer entities of brain tumors as we all know and as i've already told in my previous lecture we are moving towards the 2021 classification of brain tumors so in this transition time we are getting to know a lot of molecules 
and we are getting to see lot of newer entities which uh, we really do not know where they would fit in in the next WHO classification. So what we will try to do is see how we can approach these tumors in a resource limited setup that is available in most of the places in our country. Maybe with a slightly more uh, complex molecules to end the uh, diagnosis but then most of it will be how to approach these cases. So now let's start with case number one. This uh, is a five year old girl who presented with headache for one week and when they did an imaging they found that there was a large frontal lesion. So the clinical diagnosis before uh, surgery was uh, high grade glioma. So here we have four images. The, these are all the MRI images and we can see that there is a large right frontal tumor which looks heterogeneous. Why heterogeneous? Because some areas are slightly hyperintense, some are totally dark. So there is light contrast enhancement but not much contrast enhancement. And when you look at the T2 image, again you see that there is a heterogeneous mass. This is the SWI image which uh, is showing these black areas and on a SWI image black areas indicate that there is bleed. So all the features on imaging tell us that it is a high grade lesion. Whatever it is, it is a high grade lesion, highly heterogeneous even with areas of bleed. So with this imaging findings, a surgical excision was done near total excision. What did the histopathology show? So this is how the histopathology look like. Most of the areas in this tumor, in this right frontal tumor look like this. What are we seeing here? We are seeing sheets of tumor cells. There are a lot of blood vessels in between. These blood vessels are thin walled. They do not have heaping up of endothelium. There is no glomeruloid vascular proliferation. They are just thin walled blood vessels which are intervening between these sheets of tumor cells. Then what about the tumor cells themselves? Are they looking highly pleomorphic? No, they are relatively monomorphic actually. If you look at these tumor cells, they all look similar to each other. We are not seeing large cells, very bad looking nuclei to say that it is pleomorphic uh, looking. Then why should we call it high grade glioma at all? Should we call it high grade glioma? We will see uh, in the future slides. So slightly higher magnification of the same is again showing you lot of blood vessels. Tumor cells are arranged around these blood vessels. Background is looking glial. So it does look like a glial tumor with lot of vascularity and perivascular arrangement. Now, what are we looking at here? In the single field, we are seeing lot of mitotic figures. So, in any CNS tumor, mitosis is very important to grade the tumor. Whatever you tumor you take in the CNS, mitosis forms a very important role. So, in the single high power field, we are able to see 4 to 5 mitosis. This indicates definitely that it is a high grade tumor. And in this magnification, you can make out very fine fibrillated cytoplasm for each of these cells but it is not thick glial fibers what we usually see in any diffuse astrocytoma. So where are we headed? On just a HND section we are seeing a moderately cellular tumor, relatively monotonous cells, not much of pleomorphism. There is perivascular arrangement, lot of blood vessels in between. Did we see perivascular pseudo results? So let's look back into the slide. If you remember how an ependymoma looks, you will see fibrils which are radiating from the blood vessels. Here we are not able to appreciate the classical perivascular pseudo results, though at the first look anybody would think that these are perivascular pseudo results. These are not classical but still there is a perivascular type of arrangement and this tumor was mitotically very active. So at this point of time what will we consider to be the diagnosis? Definitely a high grade glioma because of glial stroma, it's in the intraxial plane, 
it's a child so the first diagnosis that comes to anybody's mind with lot of vascularity perivascular arrangement would be an ependymoma so to prove or disprove this we need to do ihc so i'll show you one by one what ihc markers were performed and what the results were this is wymantin immunohistochemistry and you can see that the entire tumor is diffusely strongly positive for wymantin wymantin uh, only tells us that there is this intermediate filament in the tumor cells it cannot tell us anything further so for further delineating the lineage of the tumor cells we need to do further markers so we have gone ahead and done gfap because we are thinking of a glioma here so this is gfap gfap is not as diffuse as wymantin rather it's very patchy we see here and there some gfap staining mainly around the blood vessels it is not even like the perivascular accentuation which i showed you in ependymoma so this is gfap staining patchy still uh, we can consider ependymoma that is the closest differential that we can think now we have s100 s100 is also a glial marker which looks variably positive we don't we should not take the cytoplasmic stain we should take only the nuclear stain for this uh, s100 uh, interpretation so you can see that there is patchy positivity for s100 again probably glial okay so we thought of ependymoma so what is the marker that we use for ependymoma we use epithelial membrane antigen and what is the type of positivity we look for we look for paranuclear dot positivity so not all tumor cells here are showing paranuclear dot positivity but you can see that there are these cells which are showing paranuclear dot positivity so in this field if we have to say there are some 20 to 30% of the cells which are showing this kind of paranuclear dot positivity so do i sign it out as ependymoma with all these uh, markers being positive remember that it is a supratentorial tumor because it is in the frontal uh, location it's a child so we need to do another marker which is l1 cam it is a surrogate marker for uh, rela fusion positive supratentorial ependymoma but in this case l1 cam is totally negative we have also done synaptophysin to show if there is any neuronal differentiation that is also negative so where are we standing right now right now uh, we have a glial tumor which was mitotically active which is mib labeled high proliferation index is there so is it an aplastic ependymoma mm, if you had asked or shown this this tumor probably few years back we would have signed it out as anaplastic ependymoma so what is favoring anaplastic ependymoma there is some kind of perivascular arrangement ema dot positivity is there but what is uh, not favoring ependymoma there is no fibrillated a nuclear zone around vessel those nice processes of an ependymoma which form the a nuclear zone in perivascular pseudo rosettes of an ependymoma are not there it's just the background fibril that is present and l1 cam is negative which uh, does not rule out an ependymoma it if it was positive it would have favored an ependymoma gfap is patchy to absent that can be present in an ependymoma as well so what is going against an ependymoma in this case is there is no fibrillated a nuclear zone forming our classic pseudo rosette so what is it then do we have something else that we can look at so we have done the ihc marker here which is actually showing diffuse strong positivity remember only wymantin showed such diffuse strong positivity till now no other marker was such nicely positive in all the tumor cells so what is this marker it is a nuclear marker all the tumor cell nuclei are positive so this marker is what is called as beaker 
so what is beaker that is something new which uh, we haven't heard of till the who 2016 classification so i'll tell you a little bit about what is beaker this beaker gene it's on the x chromosome and it is it stands for bcl6 co repressor so what does it do it enhances the bcl6 mediated transcription repression so what normally what it does is it has lot of role it has role in uh, pluripotency that is any cell has to differentiate into multiple lineages that is possible later it also causes differentiation and the determination of the cell into what lineage it has to go so basically it forms a very important role in a stem cell formation maintenance differentiation and then further lineage determination so what happens if there is abnormality in beaker there can be two types even germline mutations can occur it's on the x chromosome so germline mutations of uh, were first described uh, in x linked oculofacio cardial and dental syndrome later somatic alterations in the form of mutations fusions and several other alterations were described in some other tumors which are uh, examples like retinoblastoma medulloblastoma and even leukemias they have shown somatic alterations in beaker so what are these alterations as i already told you you can find mutations you can find fusions and there's one more thing that is uh, internal tandem duplication so itd stands for internal tandem duplication in beaker you can have internal tandem duplication so what is this internal tandem duplication as the name indicates a segment of this sequence of beaker will get duplicated so if all the normal people have single uh, sequence this patients or the tumors with beaker itd will have two sequence a same exact copy duplicated copy will be repeated so it's not unique to a single tumor although it was uh, described earlier in sclera cell sarcoma of the kidney later it has already been described in primitive myxoid mesenchymal tumor of infancy undifferentiated non cell sarcoma of infancy and renal malignant solitary fibrous tumors as well so there is a wide range of tumors wide range of uh, lesions which can have this beaker itd all these are non cns uh, lesions so you must be thinking why am i talking about this beaker itd what does it have connection with cns tumor and especially with what i'm showing you right now so i'll tell you in a bit if we have to do uh, identify beaker itd what simple technique that we can do is we can do a pcr where we target that region of interest where we are expecting the duplication to happen so if there is no duplication this is actually the gel electrophoresis after you do the pcr you take the product and you do gel electrophoresis so normal product will have a single band because there is no duplication suppose there is duplication which is this positive control here in addition to the normal band you will have a duplicated band so you have two bands here in our case which i showed you right now there is a single band there was beaker immunopositivity but then this beaker internal tandem duplication is not there because there is a single band on electrophoresis which was done uh, gel electrophoresis which is done after uh, running the pcr so what is it then to tell you what it is i'll show you the next case and i'll discuss both case 1 and case 2 together so case 2 is a 17 year old male patient who presented with difficulty in walking and giddiness when they did an Im imaging they saw that there was a left cerebellar mass in this patient then on digging the history they found out that he had a history of surgery 2 years back for the same cerebellar lesion but then what it was reported as those details were not available with the patient with this uh, 
left cerebellar mass on imaging and history of recurrence uh, it was thought of to be a high grade glioma or a medulloblastoma and the patient underwent surgical excision so we got the biopsy again what we are seeing here it almost resembles the first case which i showed you we have sheets of tumor cells there are a lot of blood vessels tumor cells are arranged around the blood vessels if you look at it closely you can see some free zone around the blood vessels but they are not very much fibrillated to call it perivascular pseudo rosettes again we did the same panel of ihc by maintain is diffusely positive like what we saw in the first case this is gfvp again here gfvp is patchy to almost absent in certain regions of the tumor this is s100 there if you remember in the previous case we saw patchy s100 whereas in this tumor s100 is completely negative this is olic 2 if you re can recollect what olic 2 was used for from my first lecture olic 2 comes positive diffusely in a diffuse glioma whereas in an ependymoma it is absent or it can be patchy so here in this tumor it is absent whatever positivity you are seeing these are the native glial cells i said this is a cerebellar tumor so cerebellum will have some native glial cells those have taken a polyp to otherwise the tumor is negative then we are looking at ema because even in this case the differential thought was ependymoma because we have high grade glioma again uh, it is in the cerebellum which is also a location because it's close to the fourth ventricle and this patient has had recurrence so what about ema though it is not as strong and as diffuse as what we saw in the first case if you want to consider there are occasional ema dot positive cells so do we consider this also as an ependymoma or let us see what bcor shows in this case so this is bcor stain this is a, a nuclear stain as i told you before all the tumor cells here are showing diffuse and strong positivity nuclear positivity for bcor so this is bcor immunopositivity what happened with the bcor itd here in this case you can see there are two bands whereas in our first case there was a single band here we have two bands that indicates that this tumor is showing internal tandem duplication so uh, what is this internal tandem duplication we have seen but what is its connection with cns tumors so this paper was published in 2016 feb in cell and what storm and his colleagues did was they looked at a large series of cns pnet pnet term does not exist now but when they did this study it was uh, called as pnet all those embryonal tumors which did not fit into the known entities known entities like medulloblastoma or ewing sarcoma or neuroblastoma so they took all those which did uh, look like pnet they did dna methylation profiling and they were able to genetically characterize these tumors so what was the result of this study all these uh, tumors which they took they fell into several categories some of them were high grade glioma some of them look like medulloblastoma some of them even uh, fell into the categories of etmr atrt several embryonal tumors but then what was interesting and what is of use to us here is these four entities so here after this methylation classification and genetic characterization four new entities emerged so what are these four new entities let's go clockwise so first new entity is a ewing family of tumor which shows eft cic fusion so that is the first group of tumor entity which they describe the second group is they called it cns high grade neuroepithelial tumor mn1 altered third group is what we are looking at right now cns high grade neuroepithelial tumor they called it high grade neuroepithelial tumor bcor altered so the alteration here 
what they described is internal tandem duplication. And the fourth entity they described is CNS neuroblastoma, which shows FOX R2 activation. So they have described these four new entities in 2016. And what we are looking at probably is this high grade neuroepithelial tumor because altered. So why am I calling it probably? Because after this 2016 whatever paper came up, and there were several authors, several studies were conducted and um, they described, went on to describe cases in the cerebellum where three cases were described, lot of molecules were also uh, put forth. Then Yoshida, what did, Yoshida and his colleagues, what they did, they tried to compare this CNS high grade neuroepithelial which tumor which is showing B or ITD whether it is similar to its counterpart in kidney and soft tissue. I gave you a list of uh, tumors which show this big or ITD, like clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, mixed mesenchymal tumor. So they compared with these tumors to see whether they are similar or they are different. And what they uh, concluded was that they are different from their uh, counterparts in kidney and soft tissue because they do look glial, they resemble glial tumors a lot, and their immunohistochemical profile also uh, tells that it is a neuroepithelial tumor. It is not some kind of sarcoma which is metastasizing. Then recently Ferris and his colleagues have described a uh, lot of cases of B or ITD with uh, even treatment implications of these patients. So I have shown you two cases where first one the B or uh, immunopositivity was seen but BCOR ITD was not demonstrated. The second case was where both BCOR immunopositivity was there and BCOR ITD was present. So there are three basic questions that I have put forth. Is BCOR IHC equivalent to BCOR ITD? Like if there is L1 cam positivity we say that uh, the tumor has rela fusion or if there is H3K27M positivity we definitely say tumor has H3K27 mutation. So, does the same thing stand true for BCOR IHC and BCOR ITD? If so, can we use it as a surrogate marker for identifying BCOR ITD? And are all BCOR altered CNS tumors high grade? So, if we have BCOR alteration, should we consider them as high grade and treat accordingly? So the answers to the first question you already know because I've shown you a case where Beaker IHC was positive but ITD was not present. So probably we should not be using it as a surrogate marker. Current knowledge says that we have to do the ITD. Probably in future we will be able to identify without uh, doing PCR but at present we need to do PCR then only uh, identify this B or ITD. Then what about B or altered tumors being high grade? I'll just tell you in a short while. So what we did was we looked at um, all the B or immunopositive tumors in our um, center over a period of one year. So in this one year we got four tumors which were immunopositive for B or. These were uh, in children who were 5, 4 years, then there was an adolescent who was 17 and an adult with 32 years. Three of these patients were women or girls and one was in a male patient. So it can occur in the supratentorial location or it can involve the infratentorial location. So the location doesn't matter, the tumor can exist anywhere. Symptomatically, generally they all had a short uh, duration of symptoms and histopathology wise they all look like a high grade glioma with ependymoma like morphology. Bicor IHC was positive strongly in all the cases. However, when we did sequencing for this ITD, only one case which I showed you as a second case, only this case showed positivity for internal tandem duplication. And then these patients were all treated with RT and uh, except for this uh, third case, all of them uh, had taken CT as well. So another interesting finding is that which tells you that they are high grade is these tumors tend to recur frequently. For example, the second case had recurred twice in three years. 
this patient is on treatment however is uh, showing imaging features of recurrence and is undergoing surgery so this patient has also recurred the fourth case we are having follow up so these tumors tend to recur a lot unlike ependymomas which generally don't have such frequent and such early recurrence so that is the need for we pathologist to identify this group of tumors so these are the cases this if i have to summarize the ihc profile when you need to uh, you know suspect this tumor they are tumors which are pigment and diffusely positive but gfap oleic 2 is kind of patchy negative to negative high grade then if you do bcor they all show nice strong immunopositivity sat b2 you people would have come across in other tumors sat b2 kind of uh, supplements the bcor positivity out of four cases three of our cases showed sat b2 positivity as well so uh, in th these four cases as i have already shown you the gel picture only one case is showing the itd that is uh, duplicated band when we look at the chromatogram how do we identify if it is a normal sequence there will be just single peak across whereas the segment which undergoes internal tandem duplication will show two peaks so in this positive control you can see two peaks in this case which is positive also you see two peaks when the sequence is read out you can see that this green whatever the sequence is in green it's got duplicate so that is how you can confirm if there is internal tandem duplication or not so these are the cases which have been described in the literature with respect to cns tumors most of them have shown that these are relatively seen in younger patients and uh, they can be seen in uh, all the locations cerebral cerebellar spinal all cns locations mostly look like glioma resemble ependymoma and they have uh, poor prognosis with recurrent and recurrence and metastasis however one single study that is tore it all what they did show is bcor immunopositivity was seen uh, but these patients did not show bcor itd rather uh, they they had a low grade glioma like picture on histopathology this was not high grade glioma what they saw was it looked like pilocytic astrocytoma or the tumors looked like dnet so in these patients they were all alive uh, till follow up so what it tells us is that bcor ihc tells that there is something going on with the bcor gene and the bcor protein but it does not indicate that in all cases where bcor immunopositivity is there it is itd indeed there can be bcor fusions for example tor have ha, tor at all have shown that these tumors which were bcor immunopositive were actually showing ep300 uh, fusion so uh, various other fusions also with bcor uh, like wha fusion and several other fusions can happen with bcor that also can result in over expression of bcor resulting in immunopositivity so we need to wait and uh, watch what the who will finally call this tumor as because this is a really a newly emerging entity which uh, as per current knowledge occurs in children and young adults it can occur across all the locations ependymoma or astroblastoma like morphology can be seen in these uh, patients bcor ihc is not equal to bcor itd because immunopositivity can be seen with bcor fusions and few studies have shown that bcor immunopositivity can be seen in astroblastomas also so if we have a high grade tumor and we do show that it has bcor itd then probably we can call it high grade neuroepithelial tumor bcor altered or the terminology may change in the who classification but today's drive home message with these two cases will be that there is a new entity emerging which uh, shows bcor alteration in cns tumors just like how it is it has been shown in 
kidney and soft tissues as well and uh, as a screening tool you can use bic or ihc but a confirmatory test would be to do pcr the reason to identify these tumors is that uh, they tend to recur a lot and just a simple radiation what would be given for ependymoma will not suffice these patients need to take radiation plus a multi drug chemotherapy regimen which will at least delay the recurrence and give them some kind of quality life so that is about this new entity of uh, high grade neuroepithelial tumor bcor altered so keeping that in mind and with that background we we'll move to the case next case which is case 3 uh, this is a 25 year old female again she had recurrent tumor in the right frontal region she was operated twice before first time it was reported as uh, ependymoma anaplastic ependymoma second time somewhere else it was reported as uh, choroid plex tumor and the third time patient has come to us the biopsy has come to us so what we are seeing here sorry so this is the normal neuroparenchyma this is a neuroparenchyma and here we ha- are having relatively separated out fragments of this tumor which on slightly higher magnification is showing that the tumor cells are all arranged around blood vessels forming papillary architecture so this is papillary it has a kind of papillary architecture how are the cells in between the cells are somewhat polygonal there is pleomorphism there is nuclear atypia there are even intranuclear inclusion but what is striking here are these markedly hyalinized fibrovascular cores so we saw papillae here in this focus so there are these fibrovascular cores itself which are markedly hyalinized and around them these tumor cells are arranged so next we have done again a panel of ihc it's an intraaxial tumor it's a 25 year old female patient is having recurrence it's been called ependymoma somewhere it has been called choroid plexus tumor somewhere so putting all these things together we are probably looking at a glioma so we have done gfep anything around blood vessels again you'll think of ependymoma so we have done epithelial membrane antigen ihc it was called choroid plexus tumor before so we've done cytokeratin and then of course to grade the tumor mib1 has been done so let's start interpreting all these ihcs one by one there were a whole lot of other ihcs that were done but what is important here i have just put them so here you can see there is gfap positivity but then it is not diffuse gfap positivity you have some clusters of cells here some smaller clusters of cells here which are taken gfap again telling you that there is patchy gfap positivity s100 was diffusely positive next coming to cytokeratin again there are few cells which are positive there are uh, lot of cells which are negative again patchy positivity epithelial membrane antigen so this ema in ependymoma we expect to get a paranuclear dot positivity but what are we seeing here we are not seeing dots rather we are seeing membrane positivity like cytokeratin again patchy so and then of course meb there is moderate meb1 labeling so we have gfap patchy positivity cytokeratin patchy positivity and emas also being patchy positive next uh, i'll show you the same marker that i showed you before this is again bcor you can see that diffusely positive nuclear staining in this tumor as well so should we call this bcor positive high grade neuroepithelial tumor it first thing is morphologically it doesn't look like what we saw pre- previously it has characteristic features in the form of papillary architecture hyalinized fibrovascular cores 
and uh, when uh, on IHC also there is cytokeratin positivity. EMA is not showing dot positivity, rather it is showing membrane positivity. So all these are not what we saw in the previous two tumors. So these features take us slightly away from the uh, BCOR category of tumors, but what to do we are seeing BCOR immunopositivity in this patient as well. So again I am showing you the gel picture to tell you that there was no internal tandem duplication, but we are seeing something interesting here. This is a fluorescence in situ image. Uh, and what are we seeing here? This is actually the probe is for MN1. So here there are two red and two green signals. But here if you see there is one red separate. Here there is one yellow. Yellow happens when there is a fusion. So here there is a break apart of MN1. So this is called as uh, MN1 break apart probe which we use to identify MN1 fusion. So putting together everything, it's a 25 year old female who has had recurrent lesions. On histomorphology, we are seeing classic papillary architecture. We are seeing fibrovascular uh, cores which are completely hyalinized. And then IHC wise, we are seeing uh, patchy positivity for GFAP, membrane, EMA, CK. Because is positive on IHC. So if you remember just go back few slides that I showed, I said that BCOR IHC can also be seen in astroblastoma. So what will clinch the diagnosis here is demonstration of MN1 fusion that can be done by fish by using a break apart probe. So the final diagnosis in this case is it's a astroblastoma which is MN1 altered. Astroblastoma was also described in the previous uh, classification of 2016 but um, they had not made it mandatory to show demonstrate MN1 alteration. We don't know what is going to happen in the 2021 classification but you do know that uh, every tumor is getting defined by its molecular um, characteristics. So if we have to do that, then astroblastoma, we have to demonstrate MN1 alteration. So that is the drive home message with this case. We are currently not very sure whether it is a glial tumor or not. There are a lot of debate going on whether astroblastoma should be considered as a glial tumor at all. Not only now, from its beginning, it has been... Uh, a controversial terminology itself because blastoma is also not very apt for the tumor. It's not a blastic tumor. That Blastoma al always means that it's a grade 4 tumor, which it, this is not. And here what we see classically on histopathology are, we do see pseudorosets, but then they are different from ependymoma. You have a lot of hyalinized sclerosed blood vessels from which stout processes will radiate. They have a variable immunophenotype. You can have uh, very patchy GFAP, cytokeratin, EMA positivity. These tumors tend to be all it too positive as well. So the gene that is involved in uh, astroblastoma is MN1 gene, which stands for meningioma 1 gene. It is located on the short arm, uh, long arm of chromosome 22. And uh, fusions of MN1 can happen with uh, BND2 as well as CXC5. So the technique currently available to detect this MN1 fusion is by doing break apart fish. So that is uh, all the group of newer entities. So the last case which is going to tell us, uh, give us insight into one more new entity is a 15 year old boy who presented with headache and on imaging the pre-op diagnosis was left frontal high grade tumor again. So what is the histopathology showing us? In contrast to all that we have seen uh, till now all the cases, this just the first sight of this tumor tells you that it's indeed a very very high grade tumor. A lot of undifferentiated cells are there which are diffusely infiltrating and then here you can see a very nice uh, tripolar mitotic figure. The background is of course fibrillary. 
but the individual cells kind of have a very undifferentiated almost like an embryonal tumor morphology but the background being glial uh, fibrillated we will first think of a high grade glial so it's a 15 year old boy to confirm the lineage as glial we have done GFAP and you can see that uh, tumor cells are indeed showing GFAP positive and I've repeatedly been telling that in any diffuse glioma, all it do should be positive. If it is negative, it means that it is an ep it uh, indicates that it could be an ependymoma. What are we seeing here? All it do is completely negative. So is it an ependymoma? Because it's a diffuse glioma on imaging histopathology also showed diffuse glioma features. The diffuse glioma panel that is done for all the cases is IDH, ATRX, P53. So in this case also we have done IDH, ATRX and P53. IDH1, R132H, IHC was negative. What are we seeing happening in ATRX? ATRX, if you can recollect, is normally present. If there is a mutation in ATRX, there will be loss of expression. And how do we confirm that there is loss? We can take these endothelial cells as internal control. So the internal control cells have all uh, taken positivity. The tumor cells are negative. So indicating that there is ATRX mutation. So this is complemented by diffuse P53 positivity. So now, is it a diffuse glioma? If there is ATRX loss, we always consider an astrocytic tumor, diffuse astrocytic tumor, P53 also being positive. But IDH is negative, all it do is also negative. Now what do we do? So first let's summarize what we have seen. It's an adolescent male, has a frontal lesion which is pre-op thought to be high grade glioma on histopathology lot of undifferentiated cells which are GFAP positive, olig2 negative, IDH1, R132H negative, shows ATRX loss and P53 positivity. So what are our possibilities? Yes, we think it's a high grade glioma, GFAP is positive. Then amongst high grade glioma, is it a diffuse glioma or is it an ependymoma? So for diffuse glioma, what is favoring? GFAP is positive, ATRX loss, P53 positive. All these are driving us towards a diffuse glioma. But OLIC2 being negative is putting some kind of a speed breaker to our diagnosis and telling us step back and think really it is a diffuse glioma or not. And IDH is also negative. So we need to think of it. Then is it ependymoma? For ependymoma, again GFAP positivity, olic to negativity are favoring. But then we know that ependymomas are not ATRX mutated. So ATRX loss is uh, not favoring an uh, ependymoma. Then what is it? Can it be an IDH mutant diffuse glioma? We know that IDH1 R132 H will detect only one type of mutation which is seen in about 90% of diffuse glioma but for the rest 10% we need to uh, do sequencing and uh, rule out the IDH mutations. So can it still be the, one of those rare IDH mutant diffuse glioma? Points for it are that there is ATRX loss and P53 positivity but again the point against it is that OLIC2 is completely negative. So what combination are we looking at? So we are looking at a GFAP positive olic to negative tumor. We are looking at ATRX loss and P53 positivity. Does it give us some hint? Is it tell, trying to tell us something that we are not picking up? So here is the answer to it. This is a sequencing done for histone proteins in this case. And you can see that there is a double peak here in the histone. So there is a G34R mutation. It's a heterozygous mutation. G is getting replaced by R. So this is a HCG34R mutant tumor. 
just a few words about histone. Histone, as we all know, is a protein that will wind around the DNA and it helps the chromatin to be compact so that there is no unwanted transcription and proliferation of cells. So how is this controlled? This is controlled by two complex. One is the PRC2 complex, other one is the KDM6. So PRC2 causes methylation of this H3K, H3K27. So when there is a trimethylation, that is the H3K27 ME3, there will be no transcription or there will be transcriptional repression. KDM6 demethylase does what? It removes the methylated uh, product. That is, it re causes reduction of the methylation. So, this HCK27 ME3 will be reduced. If that happens, then there will be ongoing transcription, ongoing proliferation. This should be in kind of a balance. If this balance is offset towards increased proliferation, there will be tumor. So, how can this balance be offset? This balance can be offset by mutations. You can have different types of mutations in this histone. One is the K27M mutation which occurs in the midline, in the thalamus, brain stem and spinal cord. Whereas the G34V or R mutation, we saw the R mutation here. It can also get replaced by valin. So G34R or V mutations generally occur in the cerebral hemispheres. The K27M occur in the midline and the G34RB mutations occur in the cerebral hemispheres. They can be accompanied by various other accompanying mutations. One of them is ATRX mutation. So this ATRX can get disrupted in the histone mutant tumors. Be it H3G34R mutated tumor or the H3K27M mutated tumor. When the H3 is wild type, there will be normal proliferation, normal brain development. If the methylated residue, that is the H3K27M, gets ME3 gets reduced. Remember, H3K27M is different, that is a mutant histone. H3K27ME3, that is the trimethylated form, is the normal form. So, in any uh, mutation that happens in the K27 region, the trimethylated residue will get hypomethylated. So, there will be increased transcription and oncogene expression resulting oncogenesis. All this can be associated with ATRX mutation. So, whenever there is ATRX mutation, we have to think of two possibilities. One is of course a diffuse astrocytic tumor. The second possibility is a histone mutant tumor. So, using simple IHC, you can uh, predict what could be the molecular alteration in these tumors. So, to summarize, the histone history G34RV glioma generally occur again in adolescents and young adults. They are exclusively seen in the cerebral hemispheres. They do not occur in the midline. Almost 100% of these tumors are associated with ATRX P53 mutations. They also have high frequency of MGMT promoter methylation and they tend to have an intermediate prognosis between IDH mutant tumor and the wild type tumors. So they are somewhere in intermediate uh, position. So when you have a case of a diffuse glioma, especially in a young adult or an adolescent uh, patient, Histomorphologically looking like either a very undifferentiated tumor or showing a lot of uh, perineuronal satellitosis, diffuse spread reaching up to the cortex and very importantly IDH being negative, ATRX showing loss of expression, P53 being positive and OLIC2 being negative. Remember this, OLIC2 should be negative and you see ATRX P53 uh, mutations. Then please think of this entity. I have shown you the sequencing for HCG 34RV. Antibody has come into the market. Some people are using. So 
you have all, everything available just on IHC platform and you can identify this group of tumor. It's not a very common tumor. So whatever tumors we have seen today are quite uncommon and um, I have shown you what IHC markers and what points on histomorphology will probably indicate that this molecular alteration could be present. So with limited facility what or how we can approach these newer entities. Most of the newer entities are coming up in younger population. So a lot of pediatric and young adult or tumors are getting uh, reported nowadays. So that's why if you had concentrated, you would have realized that most all the tumors that I showed you today, all four cases, were either in children or they were in young adults. So our knowledge has been limited in this group of uh, patients, brain tumors. Currently it's expanding with a lot of genetic inputs being uh, coming up. So being in a resource limited setup, what we can do is we can pick up some soft pointers from histopathology, we can pick up something from IHC and make an algorithm for ourselves and try to give the most probable diagnosis. So that is the message I wanted to drive home today. With that, uh, I have uh, dealt with all the four cases. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to take. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Shilpa. A very nice presentation and wonderful cases. So if anyone has got any questions, we can uh, yeah. ask Shilpa about it. There are no questions in the YouTube yet. Mesmerized everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a wonderful presentation. And there's a theme to the presentation, which I think one can understand. It yeah. is a very, very subtle theme. Very nicely done. So I think the questions will come from the moderator. <laughs> yeah, I, I have actually. I thought let please, others please, please, please. ask. Okay, so yeah, I uh, want to ask you about this high-grade neuroepithelial tumor with BCOR alteration. Uh, so is there any WHO grade being given to it? No, as of now there is no. First of all, it's not coming to the WHO as of now. Mm -hmm. So if you see the C-impact 6, uh, they are considering... Uh, to include it in glioma, that is a query, question mark, whether to first call it a glioma or an embryonal tumor. So there are uh, two groups of tumor into which it can fit into, either a glial tumor or an embryonal tumor, because many of these tumors show patchy positivity for GFAP and patchy. some of them show patchy positivity for even synaptophysis. That is one controversy related to this tumor. The other controversy, as I told you, is all weak or altered tumors are not high grade. There are yeah. even low grade glamours which show weak or alteration. So, they so need that's, that's my second question to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I saw, yeah, there was pilocytic astrocytoma, three cases. And then astroblastoma. Actually, astroblastoma also, you know, you can have a low grade morphology. They right. really do very well. Right. Um, right. So, uh, you were saying that when you see B core with ITD. Yeah. Is it the one which behaves bad and the others don't? Yes. As of now, uh, what cases have been described, ITDs do show bad behavior. But in our own series, four cases that I showed you, all four have behaved badly. Only one and What was the morphology in them? I think it was all ependymoma. All like. of them look like ependymoma. All of them look that like... That was astroblastoma also. You showed that case the number third, three. Yeah. Third case did not... Uh, third case was astroblastoma, but that was not included in our series of four cases that we published. So in the series of four cases that we published, all of them had uh, high-grade morphology and three of them recurred twice. Still only one showed internal tandem duplication. So my question is hmm. that um, as you were saying it is important to recognize this I mean 
Correct. I mean, it's all about people who yeah. are telling big bosses. So what I'm saying is that if you see B Corp, you're saying that it is important to uh, identify it because they need further adjuvant therapy in a, yeah. you know RT or CT. So my Correct. question is that if you are seeing ITD because you have read a lot, you know I have yeah. read. So if you see ITD, are those the one which need R? TCT and the other ones which do show weak core alteration, but not the ITT. For example, the cases of pilocytic astrocytoma right. or the you know ependymoma, which is not high grade, or the astroblastoma, they won't. Need. So, yeah. this is, can you give throw some light on that? Yeah. So, cases which show weak core ITT definitely require multi drug regimen therapy and RT. The ones which do not show ITD are not always low grade. in those tumors also there are subset which are high grade so uh, only the tumors the, the, there are only three cases which have been uh, shown to be low grade that is pilocytic astrocytoma by tor and his colleagues that paper has three cases which show uh, which are low grade other than that whatever cns tumors have been described with bicor i uh, have been high grade neuroepithelial tumors they have in one of the paper i think you were showing astroblastoma also did that case you discussed astroblastomas in their case series also were high grade all right all right so in general till now whatever has been described they're all high grade except for that single paper where they shown ep300 fusion which was low grade so in actual you are trying to say that if say you see a tumor like this and you see b core also Uh, the main thing is you're trying to say that it will recur or something. If say yeah, low yeah. or low low histomorphology, low grade histomorphology. No. In case it does have in, not not a case which looks like pilo or dement or yeah. ganglia. Anyway, like we so know they are uh, going to behave like good. So it <laughs> it does look like low grade. Just let be like uh, history K twenty seven M mutation. History K twenty seven M can come positive in pilo. Then we don't call it a high grade tumor. We don't. Create an alarm, but any diffuse glioma which is showing history K twenty seven M positivity, we upgrade the tumor. Similarly, B cor unless it shows a low grade glioma morphology, if it shows pilo or if it shows a dement morphology, just let go. But on histology, if it is showing you uh, even uh, intermediate to high grade morphology. Or it looks like astroblastoma, then definitely uh, the patient needs to be uh, treated aggressively. Thank you so much, Dr. Shilpa. Very Thank wonderful you. presentation. Yeah, indeed, very wonderful presentation. And uh, I would like to say a few things. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, not in relation to the subject, but uh, overall, um, first thing is uh, you are a very good teacher. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, uh, when I can, I can really say that uh, with a lot of conviction. And uh, the the way you teach is the way you have conceived the subject. That's a very good sign of a very good teacher. I mean, you know, you really need to understand yourself before you start teaching. And uh, the ones who teach, uh, the ones who the ones who teach slowly and very calmly, are the ones who really know the subject. So they don't need any more tantrums to teach. So that's <laughs> that's the very good quality in you. The second Thanks. thing in relation to the subject which we have discussed today is that as I can see now, sitting on this part of the world in the fringes, is that like in lymph nodes, uh, where it was told to everybody that if it is a non-infective lymph node, a proliferative lymph node, hmm. do not stick your neck on morphology. You are okay. more likely to be wrong than right. Leave it for immunohistochemistry, and then you will be surprised. Similarly, I can see in the next uh, maybe few months, uh, in the, the CNS tumors, do not stick your neck even on immunohistochemistry. Wait for the molecular, because you will be more wrong than right. Because that <laughs> is exactly how it's developing. I I, I think uh, you would you know correct me if I'm wrong. Because no, definitely, exactly uh, we are moving into molecules. Yes, and and it is showing uh, the the all the signs, uh, you know, yes. which the 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 the, fe the features which molecules are bringing up are going is yes. going to is are being seen in the prognostication of these tumors, and how true, they true. really behave. 
like the first slide which you showed the first case which you showed the the mm. moment i saw that ag truly speaking 27 years back i would have not even you know you know blinked my eye before calling it an ependymal tumor high grade correct but then sure. today you know i will not even say anything i'll just say you know go somewhere else <laughs> I, I i don't i don't i'm not you know uh, fit to give an opinion because whatever i say will be wrong <laughs> Yeah, true. yeah, it, it, yeah. There is a leaps and bound, uh, you know, transition of CNS tumors from what we knew a few years back to what is happening right now, and there's a lot of changes. Yeah, right. And this is one of the, I think, the the fruits of today's lecture and these lectures which are happening is that we are all getting the experts to tell us exactly how things are evolving. in the field of pathology i mean it's really evolving very fast very very fast yeah and things are changing i mean we all need to really you know change ourselves quickly have a molecular <laughs> lab <laughs> <laughs> very uh, yeah there is a comment from youtube i think i would like to read that uh, to you dr nabanita das says totally agree with dr nadeem sir i felt her calm tone throughout the lecture very nice class thank you so much so you see i'm not alone thank you thank you so much <laughs> yeah i mean uh, and uh, uh, and i and i i should congratulate myself for choosing the right moderator uh, right right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, that's true perfect person to be there correct to, to handle the subject to with her knowledge with her skills yeah i mean she is she was the right person there otherwise i would have been in a very bad state I think the young girl is very knowledgeable. <laughs> yes, she is. You know, you know. I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that. I mean, there's no doubts in my mind. Yes, definitely. And once this travel restrictions and all this is gone, maybe we would invite you to Calcutta to teach our students neuropathology. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, we would. I mean, I would, I would uh, ask, I would request my fellow people here in the system to. Too. But right now, I don't see that for the next six months with this COVID, COVID. coming going. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Uh, I, I would like the moderator to give her last comment before you know we close the session. Yeah, uh, Dr. Nadim, uh, I must congratulate you. You are really doing a wonderful job uh, of you know arranging these lectures by you know those who are stalwarts in pathology. Um, i mean you keep up your work it's so fantastic not only the youngsters but us also because we are students all the time how much ever old we grow i think right, there is no right. end to learning and yeah. this is what you are you know it's 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 a it's a treasure for every one of us uh, to hone our skills uh, and to be updated with the knowledge in different subspecialties of pathology thank you very much dr nadeem Oh, my pleasure. It's it's always a pleasure. Is mine. I I would like to thank you to to taking out time from your such a busy schedule, and to thank uh, uh, Dr. Shilpa to consenting to take two lectures uh, in neuropathology from her busy schedule. And you know, I can understand you people are so so busy. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shilpa. Once again, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Excellently done. I thank mean, you. Um, words cannot describe the way you have presented and this will be up uploaded on the youtube in the recorded version and uh, i am sure people will see and learn from this but before i close let me just tell you that your last lecture had an overnight viewership of more than 500 people across the globe that's great congratulations <laughs> so you are a star right thank you, thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, dr nandita for taking out time Doc, thank you so much dr shilpa and everybody thank who was there at the you. google meet and there are so many people on the youtube thank you so much bye bye take care good night bye good night good night good night, good night. Good night.